It's very uh, moving for me, uh, and I'm very grateful to Henry for coming uh, up from New York to introduce me. I remember vividly that encounter uh, in his office in the PAC in uh, 1975. Wesleyan changed my life. My parents didn't go to school, uh, to college. Um, they um, were very surprised when I came home and said, I'm going to major in the history of psychological theory. <laughs> they um, uh, let me do what I wanted to do, as did Wesleyan, uh, or so it felt as a student. They let me pursue an education that was broad, that was experimental, that sometimes felt like I was wasting time because I wasn't sure exactly where it was going to go. Um, and uh, it made me work harder than I ever thought I could work at things that I cared about passionately and still care about passionately. Today, all over the country, people are saying, why are you going to a place like Wesleyan? Is it because you're rich, so you can loaf about? Is it because you don't know where the economy is going? Is it because you're entitled, or to use the word that we love to use here at Wesleyan, privileged? Why are you going to college, people ask, all over the country, all over the world? You're a girl. Why do you go to college? Why do you go to school? You're a rag picker. Why do you go to college? You don't need a broad education. You become from a social class that will never use the education. So why are you going for a form of learning that has no obvious instrumental purpose? These are complaints that are coming from industry. They're coming from academia. They're coming so often from people who had a good education. One of the most prominent members of this chorus of anti-intellectualism is Peter Thiel, who has a few degrees from Stanford. He just has recognized that many other people don't need that. Because you could fit into a machine. Others will run the machine. This, I think, is an assault on, ine on equality. It is an attempt to continue the trends to create greater and greater inequality in America by denying education as a vehicle for social change and economic mobility. It's a fancy argument made by fancy people, but I think it's a crude attempt to make sure that hierarchies stay stable and that if there is going to be an education that's broad, conceptual, and aversive, that the people who will have that will be the people who won't rock the boat because they will be accustomed to their privileges. This is very different from the history of liberal education in the United States. And I wanted, in the next 25 minutes or so, sketch for you that history, that dream, that American dream, that education should be a vehicle not to cement social privilege, but to create the possibility of social change. There's four parts of this. One is liberate, two is animate, three is cooperate, and four is instigate. There are only four because uh, it was a great achievement for me to remember more than three things, and I got to four and I thought I should stop there. So let me start with liberate. Let me start with Thomas Jefferson, whose view of education led to his creation, founding of the University of Virginia. And, there, and his work on education was clearly connected to a strong impulse that runs through the history of American thinking on education, which was, let's not be Harvard. I want, Jefferson said, to create an institution that will not repeat the mistakes of Harvard. And this runs through all kinds of commentaries on American higher education over the last couple of hundred years. For Jefferson, a man of the Enlightenment, education was to allow you to stand on your own feet. 
It was to give you independence. It would set you free by allowing you to find your own path while acquiring the skills to make that path productive, multidimensional, steeped in inquiry. So for Jefferson, that meant very, something very simple when it came to, when it came to uh, the university. When you started out at Harvard in the uh, late 1700s, you started out on a track. You knew where you were going to end up. You signed up for a path of study that led to a specific profession or vocation. Jefferson thought, that's kind of crazy. The whole point of education is to discover new things. If you start off as a first-year student and say, I'm going to be a minister, or I'm going to be a professional, or I'm going to go into commerce, you're, you, you're already limiting what you might possibly learn. So for Jefferson, what was so key was when you begin, don't have the goal in mind. Because the goal is not to end up as a minister or to end up as a scientist or to end up as a, a, a professional. The goal is inquiry itself. Ours will be the follies of enthusiasm. Jefferson writes to uh, Adams, not of bigotry. Ours will be the follies of enthusiasm. It's a wonderful phrase. We should put it up in the chapel. Follies of enthusiasm. But you, I know, we're in Wesley, and you're all sitting there thinking, yeah, right, not bigotry, Jefferson. The only thing you, we all know about Jefferson is that he was a bigot, right? The only thing we all know about Jefferson is about racism and Sally Hemings and hypocrisy. Absolutely important, of course. It's especially important because it runs against this impulse to education and equality that's fundamental for his thinking. Jefferson was a man of great prejudices, and as a historian, I'm supposed to say, like many people of his time, he had a, 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 additional prejudices, too. He took them further than many. But for my purposes and the remarks I want to make to you today, it's not Jefferson the hypocrite that's important. It's Jefferson the inspiration for a vision of education that is grounded in the desire for equality. Jefferson worried that if we didn't have this kind of education, rich people would cement their privileges by cutting off access to learning for the poor so that the rich would only have their children educated, sprinkle in a few poor people to make them feel more well-rounded, and you would have oligarchies reproducing themselves. You would have hierarchy reproducing themselves. You would have an unnatural aristocracy of dumber and dumber people having more and more money. He thought in the government you would have more and more representatives whose only task was to guarantee their own re-election by dumbing down their interactions with the, their fellow citizens so once again, you stifled change, social justice, and created an, what he called an unnatural aristocracy, that is, the cultivation of stupidity through institutions of education. That would be unkind to say that that's what we have now. But it sounds familiar in many ways, right? Where the rich guarantee their slots in institutions, so as to pass on their privileges to their children. Now, you can follow the route of Steven Pinker and say, well, that's because they're genetically superior. But Steven Pinker has to appeal to his audience. I don't have to appeal to that audience. What's also important to me for, uh, about Jefferson in this regard is how he was inspirational for so many other kinds of people. And I want to give you, in the book, I talk about a bunch of them, but I want to talk to you a little bit about David Walker, who in some ways was an violently anti-Jeffersonian because he, he was, David Walker was a free black living in New England, uh, and he wrote a pamphlet asking uh, uh, slaves to rebel against their masters, kill them, and take their path to freedom. Kill them if they had to, and take their path to freedom. Walker was, was you know, a price was put on his head, he was, you know, they wanted him brought back alive so he could be tortured to death, <laughs> 
um, uh, uh, he, he put the pamphlet, he sewed it in, he was a tailor, he sewed it into the clothes of, of travelers and of, uh, 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 of sailors. And in this pamphlet, Walker says, Jefferson denies us, we black people, he denies us the most fundamental element of our humanity, that is the capacity to be educated. Walker says, I, a free man, what I want more than anything is to exercise my freedom through education. So although Walker was violently anti-Jefferson, because Jefferson was a racist, he was completely Jeffersonian in his, in his vision of education. I'm grabbing this because I want to read you the quote because I, 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 it's too good to paraphrase. I pray that the Lord may undeceive my ignorant brethren. Walker writes in his appeal in 1829. I pray that the Lord may undeceive my ignorant brethren and permit them to throw away pretensions and seek after the substance of learning. And this is the part... As a teacher, I so love, I would crawl on my hands and knees through mud and mire to the feet of a learned man, where I would sit and humbly supplicate him to instill into me that which neither devils nor tyrants could remove, only with my life. For colored people to acquire learning in this country, Walker concludes, makes tyrants quake and tremble on their sandy foundation. For colored people to acquire learning in this country makes tyrants quake and tremble on their sandy foundation. He's taking Jefferson and applying it right to the struggle against slavery. As did Frederick Douglass. A little bit later in the autobiography, Frederick Douglass tells the story of how as a young slave, his mistress taught him to read the Bible. You know the story. Some of you know the story. I hesitate to tell it in front of an audience that includes American studies professors. You'll forgive my distortions, I hope. But Frederick Douglass, right, he, he says he's taught to read and, and, and uh, in Baltimore, uh, his mistress calls him into the parlor because the master is there, her, her husband, and, and she's going to show him this little black kid can read, the slave. It's like, uh, it's a miracle. So he reads, and, and the master says these fateful words. He says, you can't teach a black boy to read. He will be unfit for slavery. Unfit for slavery. And Douglas says, my biggest lesson, right? My biggest lesson. Education makes us unfit for slavery. And that's why so many are trying to deny access to education to so many today. Liberate. Education liberates. Animate. Here I'll be more brief because you're, you don't, your patience isn't endless, I'm sure. But it, it's so, I have to tell you about Emerson. Emerson, who so many of you read in your classes, at least I hope so, um, uh, or have read in other places. Uh, Emerson, who writes when he goes to when he goes to talk to Harvard, in a chapel like this, probably he goes to Harvard and he tells people, "You're you're getting a terrible, not even an education. You're getting corrupted here. What should happen in a college is not that you get instilled into you the views of your professors, God forbid, or that you get instilled into you information that you can then just cite at the appropriate dinner party." Ben Franklin said what happened at Harvard was that you learned how to walk out of a drawing room backwards so you wouldn't offend. Emerson says what should happen is we should set your hearts aflame. Not drill you, but to ignite your spirit. And Emerson thinks that if that happens, what happens to you, students and teachers, is that the world becomes more alive. It becomes more animated. And you've certainly had this experience in class. I know I did in Professor Abelov's class and other classes I had, especially here at Wesleyan. Less in graduate school, I have to admit. 
that suddenly things you missed before, you, you, you see them now. My goodness, that's what it is. And some of them can be terrible things. You see racism where you didn't know it was there. You see privilege you need to fight against that you didn't know it was there. And some of them are beautiful. You, you, there's music around you didn't even know it was music, right? There are paintings you didn't know how to look at, and suddenly those paintings are, are jumping off the walls at you. The world is more animated. You are more alive because you're educated. You're not just more skillful. You don't have a fatter wallet. You're more alive because you make the world alive when you're educated. Set your heart aflame and the whole world is warmer from Emerson's perspective. But he's not just, you know, he's not just saying that we could all be happy and see the music and hear the poetry and <laughs> smell the roses, right? He, Emerson's also thinking, and when you see that, you realize how many people are trying to crush the spirit of the world and kill off life. That when you learn to animate, you are learning something that he calls aversive, that goes against the grain. So liberate animate my third term my third term is uh, cooperate and I'll, I'll say uh, uh, just a couple of words about uh, William James um, and, um, and Jane Addams who I write about in, the, in, in this little book which you can buy apparently next door after this is done and, and then and then, um, and all the money, all the money, the 75 cents that I would normally get will go to financial aid at Wesleyan. Um, uh, and uh, uh, William James, he says, what's the point of education? It's just creating habits of action. The, the, whole, the whole point of learning is creating habits of action. James is, as you know, a pragmatist. And all thinking should be turned to habits of action. But that's not the James I want to uh, uh, talk to you about this evening. I want to mention one essay of, of, of uh, William James. Um, um, it's called On a Certain Blindness in Human Beings. It's a little essay based on a talk he gave to teachers. Uh, James says, James says uh, that he was riding along in a carriage, I think in North Carolina, if memory serves, and uh, he's looking around, and they had cleared the forest, and they were like burning fires, burning the stumps, and you know, uh, 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 homesteading, and, and he's looking around, and he's, he's kind of horrified by this. He thinks, Where's it? it was a beautiful forest, and now it's, it's, it's got the scars of human intervention. And as he's musing about this, his driver turns to him and says, isn't it wonderful? Once we get to cultivating, there's no stopping us. We're, we're creating homes for everyone. And James says something like this. He says, I was completely blind to the way he saw the world, just as if he came by my office in Cambridge, yet again, Cambridge, and saw me studying my book, he'd probably look inside and say, oh, the poor guy, he's probably in, been, been punished, locked up and punished. He'd be blind to my world. And so what James urges us is to overcome our blindness, not by acquiring more information, but by acquiring the capacity to see things from someone else's point of view. And that James is what was, who was so instrumental for Jane Addams. Jane Addams who, excuse me, had enormous intellectual ambition and the, and the gifts, the intellectual gifts to match it. And, and she, 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 she wanted to go to college, she wanted to go to Smith. But her father said, a girl, you don't go to Smith. Well, actually, doesn't make, any, doesn't make any sense at all, does it, Susie? Um, she, he, he, you're, 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 you don't, you're a girl, you don't go to college. Even though Smith would be the place you could go, you're not going to, you're, you're not going to college. Uh, let's start off sending you to a, a convent school. She goes to get a religious education. She knocks the ball out of the park, so to speak. You know, she, uh, I don't know how you do that in a convent school, but you, she's on the school newspaper. She's, she's, she's a, you know, a valedictorian. She's, she's, she's doing all these great things. And so she feels that she's showing how great she is. Her father will let her go to Smith, and then she can become a doctor. That was her ambition. And uh, when she graduates, he says something along the lines that you're too nervous, you're too weak, you're too feeble, you're too prone to hysteria, these kinds of comments. Um, and, um, and she's very 
and distraught by this and angry even, and angry, and then her father dies. Now, the Freudians in the audience will not be surprised, and I hope there are many, um, will not be surprised that, in fact, once that happens, she doesn't just go off to Smith, right? She has all this money. He leaves her a pile of money, freedom to do whatever she wants. But, you know, someone like Freud said the, the most powerful father is a dead father. Um, and, and so uh, she obeys his wishes, renounces higher education, but, but goes on another kind of educational route. She, she takes off to Europe with some friends, and she, she studies, and she travels, and she learns lots of things around the world. And here we're coming to the, my point about talking about Jane Addams. So one day, she's walking down the street in, in London, I, I think, um, and as she's about to cross the road, she sees this guy step in front of a carriage and get run over by a, a, a horse-drawn carriage, knocked to the ground. And what does she do? She thinks of a passage in De Quincey, which is citing a passage in Homer about the inability to act in the face of tragedy. And then she thinks, why has my learning made me incapable of a basic human response to suffering? She says, and she writes about this, I had lumbered my mind with literature. It's a great phrase, isn't it? I had lumbered my mind with literature to such an extent that I was now incapable of reacting even to an accident that happened right in front of me. I thought of a poem about a poem about an action instead of trying to help. So Jane Addams, as you probably know, she took off her coat. She went back to Chicago. That's a terrible metaphor. It's the worst thing to do, to take off her coat and go to Chicago. But she went back to Chicago, and she founded Hull House, and she, and she created a whole network of, 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 of people who would take their talents and put them in the service of cooperation with citizens, especially the most vulnerable citizens, the poor, immigrants, and so for Jane Addams, education should be divorced from sophistication and wedded to social engagement. A liberal education shouldn't just lumber your minds with literature so that you would know how to impress your friends at a cocktail party by saying something about, um, um, uh, I don't know, intersubjectivity. Or in my class, we asked, I asked them, what, was the, what are the words that you can use to most impress people? And they said, the first one that came up was heteronormativity. That was a, that was a, a, good, that was a good icebreaker, uh, people told me. Um, intersectionality works well, too, I'm told, at parties. Um, uh, uh, when I, when, I don't remember what it was when I was a student. Uh, 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 but, but logocentrism. Logocentrism. Fallow logocentrism. Very good. Thank you, Adam. So, so uh, and, and that actually is, that's just a good word. No. <laughs> So, so Adam, Adam says that we, we need to put our education not in the service of impressing other people, of vanity, as we so called it, but it, of, of serving other people. And she writes a beautiful essay called The Modern Lear, in which she says, echoing James, that what would be best about education would be if, if it enabled us to understand why someone else disagrees with us. Maybe why someone else has the wrong idea, but why to them it seems like the right idea. So for, for Jane Addams, one of the things we learn to do so well at strong institutions like this one is we learn how to prove we're right. And the most important thing for someone who wants to prove she's right or he's right is to exclude other possibilities. And what Jane Addams called for instead, the alternative, was a sympathetic imagination that would strive to understand how someone else could be right, someone other than yourself. Overcoming a blindness, as William James said. Leading to cooperation is what Jane Addams said. So we've gone from liberate with Jefferson and Walker and Frederick Douglass to animate with Emerson cooperate with James and 
Jane Addams with and 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 I have to use John Dewey here as a kind of bridge between cooperate and instigate. Because Dewey was all about cooperation. Dewey said, you know, Dewey said so many brilliant things, but he said them so poorly. <laughs> you know, I think it's Oliver Wendell Holmes who says that uh, if God uh, uh, spoke, he, he would say the things that John Dewey says if God was inarticulate. <laughs> Uh, and 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 to, to Dewey is sometimes you have to really fish for the pearls. But but what what Dewey said was that in education, especially childhood education, and maybe you see this at Wesleyan students could tell me that we fetishize independence, like Jefferson did to some extent. We want you to stand on your own feet, show you can do it yourself. We had a meeting today about the difficulties of when you have group projects of knowing who did what. Dewey said, this is a strange form of psychopathology. <laughs> Why would you curtail interdependence? Interdependence is what we need. We don't need independence. Independence is malignant, Dewey said, with another 50 or 60 words in that sense. And so what we need instead is cooperation in the service of social and intellectual problems that we recognize as meaningful. So in an essay called On the Recovery of Philosophy, um, he, he talks about getting rid of so-called philosophical problems. I say so-called because he didn't really believe they were problems. And turn philosophy on the problems that you and I recognize as real. Not the problems that are generated by a guild for a guild cooperate with ideas in the service of the most vulnerable, in the service of inquiry. From this notion of cooperation, I will go to my final words about uh, under the heading of instigate or instigation. And, and here I, I want to um, just refer to uh, a, a, a philosopher, Richard Rorty, who was, who was my teacher, uh, at Princeton, um, he didn't write a lot about education. He wrote a lot about how pro philosophers' problems weren't real problems, and he and, and he he re-injected pragmatism with intellectual and social energy. But what Dick Rorty um, uh, said about education was this: that up to a certain time, you're going to um, have to acquire the ideas that other people thought were valuable. But that time precedes the time you go to college. What should happen in a college or university is that students should be encouraged to instigate aversive thinking to break up consensus. There's a lot of talk from neurobiology to ethics about the value of consensus and harmony. We should learn those things. Consilience, I think, was E.O. Wilson's word for it. Rorty was the kind of person who thought that that kind of um, goal of an end of inquiry or of an end of argument was completely misguided. What we want students to do, and at a place like Wesleyan, they do it whether we want that or not, is to instigate challenges against the prevailing consensus. Because inquiry, because science always works in relation to, to but ag also against a consensus. Consensus is something that is just the free stage, the foundation for further inquiry, further disagreement. Consensus is a conversation stopper not an inspiration to inquiry and social change. Rorty felt this way, as does Martha Nussbaum and a host of, of uh, contemporary writers about liberal education, because he felt that without that instigation to aversive thinking and undermining consensus, we are likely to have educational institutions that reproduce the status quo. And what liberal education has been about since the time of Jefferson is to push against the reification of the status quo. 
to push against the desire of people in my position <laughs> to keep things the same and to create change through inquiry, to delight in inquiry because it makes the world more alive, to celebrate dissensus because it makes us feel more free, to undertake projects of aversive thinking because it's through them that we can learn to cooperate together to make social change that's meaningful, not just for ourselves, but for other people who might be paying attention to what we do. Liberal education in the United States, I think, has been a resource for Americans who are trying to find ways to prevent the reification of hierarchy and the increase in economic and social inequality. Today, to use that resource against those who would cut off access seems to me not just an act of a university, but an act of citizens, an act of, of people who are dissatisfied with the prevailing consensus and who think of education as a vehicle for freedom, um, uh, freedom through inquiry. And um, that kind of freedom seems to me particularly sweet tonight um, uh, at, at this my home, uh, Wesleyan. Thank you very much.